this awesome carpet has kind of gone to waste this weekend. Everyone's hiding behind the podium, so I'm going to try to stay confined in this space. Um, first of all, I'm really, really glad to be here. Uh, second of all, I'm here because I gave this talk exactly once with the intent of only ever giving it once um, at Kalamazoo X in April, which is a fantastic nearby enough conference that you should all consider going to next year. Only because Ruby Buddha up there, after I gave it, said, hey, you should totally give this at Re Madison Ruby. So if you love it, thank him. And if you hate it, blame him. <laughs> um, so let's get started. When I first came out of college, I was really, really anxious because I was convinced that my code sucked um, and that I didn't know anything about building real applications, uh, and I was right. And my, uh, it showed. So my first manager and my first technical lead pulled me aside, and they gave me this advice. They said, Justin, you really need to grow a thicker skin. And I didn't know whether to take that advice or not. I didn't know how to take it. And all I really realized was that over six months of working with them, that their concept of a thick skin really was more of a myopia, in my opinion. It, it, it narrowed their vision to only what was right in front of them. Uh, things didn't hurt their feelings when they happened, but they also lacked an awareness of what was going on around them. And I realized that, you know, to, 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 to strive to have a thick skin is really an unnatural condition for us as humans because we objectively have thin skins. So that I, I renamed the talk. It's actually Office Politics for the Humans. Um, so hopefully this is relevant to you. If you're not a human, I apologize. I, li I, I like to start off talks at the very basic, so some basic term uh, definition. Uh, uh, I define the word politics. Uh, I'll actually, I go back to the Greek. Uh, it's a two-part word, poly meaning many, and ticks meaning blood-sucking parasites. <laughs> but you know, why... We've taken this beautiful word, this beautiful definition, and we've completely ruined it. Um, in, in the United States of America, we have this two-party system, uh, and we all tend to have either a lot of emotion or a lot of just anger towards the concept of politics, uh, whether that's that we think that uh, politics is, you know, the, the men in suits taking money from the poor and giving to the rich, or even whether we have an aspirational view of politics, uh, that like through grassroots community organizing, we can actually affect real change. It's actually not Jim. Uh, <laughs> I love you, Jim. But, but the reason that I just did that, why I just denigrated Republicans and promoted Democrats a little bit, is because the other aspect, where we view the two-party system as this zero-sum game, and that's kind of where we conceive of politics, um, but, of course, what's ridiculous about it, this visceral emotional reaction that we all have, is that we don't really have that much of an impact on it. And uh, on top of that, it doesn't really matter. It sort of reminds me, like, I love this image of, you know, uh, two toys of fictional characters battling it out. Because it's like politics. Because, like, first of all, it doesn't matter. And second of all, whoever wins, we lose. So, <laughs> I... I don't want you to think about that type of politics, say, when I talk about office politics. Um, I just... Do whatever you need to do, flush it, reset your mind, think about something else. Think about, um, uh, uh, I like the image of water because uh, uh, if, if, if everyone's like a little water drop making a little splash, um, making an outsized impact without doing anything more is how I try to view making changes within organizations. Because uh, I'm just one little guy and if I can just make a bigger impact in the world around me, then, you know, that makes me happy, I guess. Why do we work? So today I'm going to talk uh, about four virtues. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, explain how to be like, you know, a manipulative person and like navigate all the chummy waters of, of, of complex organizations, but I'm going to share four character traits that I think are really important to at least get started. Uh, and the way that I'm going to try to convey that is with four stories from my own professional career. Uh, these are things that either happened to me, one of them is uh, uh, something that happened to a friend of mine, uh, a project. And you know, these stories on their own, they're not going to convey to you the skill that you need to, like, master this, but hopefully it'll, like, at least resonate a little bit with something that you've experienced, and maybe you can just kind of key into it uh, later, so in the future you can kind of, like, build these reflex muscles. Um, and I'm also, like, I like telling stories because I'm, like, a career-long consultant. Um, I, I know we've got a few consultants in here. I love being a consultant thinking about this topic because every six months I get to swoop into a new organization, uh, I experiment on people, you know, the organization goes to hell, and I swoop out, and then I send an invoice. And uh, 
If you don't love soft talks, uh, I know we've got a lot of soft talks here. If you don't love soft talks, feel free to try to uh, uh, beat my count. I, I counted 96 stick figures in this presentation. Uh, if uh, uh, you want to just not think about what I'm saying and instead count stick figures and correct me at the end, uh, I will give you a prize. To be determined. You can have Jim's beard. Uh, so the first virtue I want to talk about is awareness, and I think this is the most important one. We're going to spend the most time on it. Uh, and uh, uh, if you have awareness of the world around you, above and beyond, just like what you've been asked to do for your job, you can accomplish a lot. I studied Japanese in college. The first idiom in Japanese that I learned was deru kui wa utareru, which literally ish means the stake that sticks out or the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. Uh, I think this is the approach that we have to mentally conceiving of work post-industrial revolution. By standing out, we kind of put ourselves at risk, so the safe and easy thing to do is keep our head down, do the job to which we were prescribed. And if we follow the straight and narrow path, we will, follow, we will walk up the stairway of success and ultimately reach the zenith, and you know, we will have been successful, whatever that means to us. But of course, I don't really, I'm cynical. I don't believe in a stairway to success. I, you know, there's no corporate ladder. It's just people stepping on each other. Um, and and by, doing a, by, by finding success by only doing the job that I was asked to do harder, uh, I don't think that's the effective way to do it. And I think the best way to demonstrate that is to talk about uh, local versus global optimization. Because I found in lots of organizations that a team actually overperforming and really kicking ass has the net effect, counter to the overall goal of the success of the big organization that they're at, of slowing down the overall system. And uh, I witnessed this a couple years ago, and I want to share it to you as sort of a uh, block diagram history of how this company came to be and then how I messed it all up. Uh, so it started, like a lot of applications do, uh, a programmer and a user. The user got value from what the programmer was doing. And that worked pretty well for a time until they uh, decided to introduce a product owner who'd organize the work into a backlog and, and add a little bit of structure and cadence. Uh, eventually, the team grew. There was uh, you know, a couple programmers and a designer. There was, uh, uh, once, the, once the application started providing real, meaningful business value, the business came on because uh, now they cared, and so they start coordinating with the product owner. You see how the product owner kind of is the hub in a hub-and-spoke communication model here that only works for so, until you get so big. Um, you know, they have a tester, too, because once it's providing business value, they want to make sure that fewer and fewer bugs actually make it to the user. Uh, they uh, continue to grow, so zoom out a little bit. That consider that a development team now so that we can make room in our chart for, you know, a release manager, somebody who's concerned about let's, let's maintain multiple branches of the code and figure out uh, when and how we release and add a little bit of formality there. Uh, they added a sales guy, so now the product owner takes a little bit of pressure off him, not directly in, uh, interacting with the users anymore. The, instead. New requirements come in through sales to the business, back to the product owner. QA, the tester becomes a kind of QA team over time as things grow. Sales guy becomes a sales team. The organization is getting bigger and bigger, so zoom out again. Uh, and now uh, uh, instead of just one development team, uh, uh, we add a second development team and another product owner. And it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that it was necessary from the product's perspective, but in their particular case, it's just the room got full. So there's like, oh, time for a new team. That's how teams are. Isn't that how teams are formed, usually? So zoom out again, because uh, when you arbitrarily divide teams like that, it usually means that they're actually sharing one code base, or the product delineation isn't clear. They share a lot of shared resources, which is a great way to slow your organization down. Um, and, and to manage that and facilitate that, co uh, that coordination that was necessary, instead of just being a release manager, now he's kind of a change management responsibility to keep all the plates spinning. And additionally, they had a DevOps team because the two teams shared production environments and somebody had to be the gatekeeper. And then finally, they added a DBA who would be responsible for any schema changes and kind of be a gate check before to make sure that any change that one team wanted to make the schema would be copacetic with the other. This is all, you know, this story's been told a thousand times. Um, and, and, and as such, things really started to slow down because any new change, any new feature just had to take a lot more coordination and effort and communication across all these different people. So the business, you know, they get upset. They're like, why you no ship software anymore? <laughs> and the business goes to like their local conference and they get all jazzed because they hear about new methodologies. Every decade it's a new thing. This time it was agile. 
They, and they, they found out, you know, like, wow, with Agile teams, they get fast feedback. You get, you know, uh, all these cool practices. They work directly with the business. And, it's, you know, ironically, that's exactly where they were at the beginning of this diagram. Uh, but so they bring in some consultants, and they, they put the consultants on a stage in front of everyone, and they, s they say to the entire organization, this is awesome team. These guys are, <laughs> these guys are the Agile awesome guys. And we're going to work with them, and you know, we're going to do this Agile transformation, but we're going to start with them, and then we're going to roll it out to everybody. And you're all going to just be, it's going to be fantastic. We're going to get more done. I was on Awesome Team. <laughs> and uh, the best part about being on Awesome Team, you see this little red box around here, is uh, uh, we kind of had a hall pass. You know, we had the CTO, the CIO, all these big wigs inside of this very large organization. Uh, uh, kind of gave us just carte blanche. They said, you know, you need anything, you just push on people and tell them, call me if you've got a problem. So we were able to, like, you see all these, like, little arrows are bi-directional. Ours weren't, because we could just push on people. <laughs> so, you know, the, the DBA, they had a stressful life, because every time somebody needed a column change, the process in this organization was, like, three pieces of paper had to get filled out. And so when we told them we're going to be changing columns every day, they, they freaked out, because it really, really upset their apple cart. DevOps team, same thing. There's a crazy Oracle, nasty, proprietary uh, runtime production system. And even to get a new dev server set up, because they only had like one, was apparently a three-month job and cost like hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so when we told them that we were like, we're going to be receiving one in two weeks, <laughs> they got upset. The QA team, they saw us come, they were, they were worried that, uh, you know, we didn't talk to them. We were like, oh, no, we, we actually we do behavior-driven development, test-driven development, you know, we don't really need you. Uh, so then they felt immediately threatened because they're like, well, they're going to roll this out everywhere. What's going to happen to me? Um, and then the change management people, they, they were extremely uh, worried when we would talk about things like shipping code. Um, <laughs> they, they literally had a meeting every Friday, and it was a really short meeting, and it was like scheduled at like 4.45, and it was like everyone in the organization who might in, instigate change inside of the production environment. And the whole, like the, the ideal pace of this meeting was everyone would just be asked, hey, you got any changes in production? Everyone would say no, and be like, oh, hey, good, good, good weekend. And so when we came in, we we're like, hey, we're starting this new project, and we're going to be in production in, you know, like uh, a couple of weeks, and then we're going to want to deploy nightly. Uh, it just, like, blew their mind. Um, so they didn't love us. Um, but the business was super happy because we were, were getting really, really fast feedback. We built an app faster than they could ever have remembered. Um, and, and we had a lot of fun, too, and it felt like a real big success. But everyone else in the organization was a little grumpy. Uh, and the change management person in particular, uh, they were really angry. And, and here's a fun trick to try. If you ever work in a publicly traded organization, find whoever this role is and then get them really agitated and talk about all the changes you're going to do. Uh, because if it's a publicly traded organization, it's very likely that not only will they froth at the mouth, but every third word will be socks. And uh, <laughs> I found that the best way to end a conversation uh, in such an environment is just to use socks, uh, the play the socks card. And no one understands why you can't do it, but that's why. And then it just ends the conversation. You can go about your day. So uh, uh, when that was the state of the overall organization, uh, however, uh, the first project, very, very successful. The second project, everyone schemed against us. And suddenly, we weren't getting our column changes anymore. And the DevOps team wasn't providing our, actually, our environment had to restart every 20 minutes. And we couldn't make any forward progress. And it was almost as if they were trying to work us out. And they succeeded. The overall organism rejected the parasite. And the new business arrived. <laughs> The CIOs all got new jobs elsewhere, and you know, me being a consultant, I floated away to my next thing. Awareness. That, so, so, so I didn't exactly see all of that coming. This is the, the benefit of hindsight. I'm able to make this diagram, but I saw a lot of it coming. We actually like, sat down with the executives, and we're like, this is where this is going to end up. You know, the end of the story is not great. Uh, and they, they were still confident. They wanted to try it out anyway, and we're like, all right, cool. Let's, let's experiment. But awareness is really, really important to understanding what's going on around you, obviously. I think empathy is also incredibly important. Uh, this is a photograph of me on the first day of every project ever. <laughs> uh, I, I, it's a powerful moment, right? Because you have the outsider result. You still got this positive energy. You want to affect change. Uh, and you can, if you're an empathetic individual, why empathy is so powerful is you can identify why everyone else is having a bad time 
or why they're having a good time and help them succeed and, and try to uh, uh, help fix their problems by feeling what they're feeling. But the downside of empathy, that is feeling what other people are feeling, is it has a normalizing effect over time. So like me six months later, I'm just one of the blue frowny faces. Um, but empathy is incredibly powerful, especially when it's used in relatively healthy social environments. Um, and I think that even though developers have a bad rap as being not very emotionally aware or intelligent, we all are actually very successful empathetic creatures. And my favorite like, obvious example of this that I hope you can relate to, I think most developers can, uh, similar to how the Lorax speaks for the trees who, who cannot speak for they have no tongues, we as developers are very often the advocates of the user. You know, we're told, hey, you gotta go implement this story, uh, and we think about what that would be actually be like from a user's perspective, and then we push back a little bit because the user's not in the room, and they can't advocate for it. And uh, uh, one of my favorite little stories of user advocacy from a programmer uh, came out of a uh, uh, woman who ran a business. She woke up one day, and she had an awesome software product idea. Uh, she owned a, freight, a local freight shipping business, and all, everything was manual. Everything was by hand. They just wrote little checklists of, of where they'd been and, and kept track with manual paper logs. But the iPad had come out. So she, she contracted my friend, a local like mobile iOS app, and they converted all that stuff over to the iPad. It was actually a really quick win. It, and and it, it was fantastic, and it revolutionized the business really quickly. So yay, software. And then that evening in the bathtub, she had the idea like, hey, I could actually leverage this and do so much more now for my business. And her idea was, well, I've got all these ships or all these uh, trucks out in the field, uh, and I've got a business manager in the office, and he's got a smartphone. And all these trucks now, they have iPads, which have antennae and GPS um, uh, that they're broadcasting all the time. So why can't we just add to the app something that makes me able to like, keep tabs on where everyone is? And so then that way, you know, I could know that uh, Jack is out for delivery, or Jane is getting her car filled up, or uh, I gotta pick a name, Zach is out, out at lunch, or Sarah is playing bocce ball with Zach the cat. <laughs> That's Zach the cat, and that's Sarah. So the programmer pulls this story off the card wall, and he thinks to himself, um, well, what would this actually be like for a user? He already knows location service is cold. He could implement this really easily, but just in sort of you know, feeling out like what, what's actually trying to be accomplished here, he empathized with the user a little bit. He's like, well, if I was one of these delivery people, I probably would not appreciate somebody surreptitiously logging everywhere that I am and keeping tabs on me and what I'm doing, especially if I don't have any sort of notification of that. And so he raised that issue uh, with, with the product owner who just could only see how this would be really valuable to her business um, and, and, and didn't empathize. And so then he called the lawyer and suddenly when the lawyer realized all the liability of like, you know, spying on people without notification, then suddenly the product owner really did empathize. Uh, and uh, uh, it ended up, you know, they ended up moving much more cautiously in that area as opposed to just outright spying on people. But sometimes it takes that. In a lot of ways, programmers, I think, are like the last line of defense of like really bad ideas because we're the ones with the keyboards. Um, but that's just one example. I think that's, that's an example how empathy is powerful, but I think if you apply empathy just beyond user advocacy, which I think we're all used to, and instead think, hey, coworker, like, try to understand where they're at emotionally. What's driving them? What incentivizes them? What makes them happy or sad? How can we help them win? Um, uh, uh, it's a powerful thing, and I think that we can, you know, make a lot of progress getting people on board with what you want to do. Unity is the next thing I want to talk about, because once people are on board with you, it's important that they stay on board with you, because it's it critically important uh, uh, that everyone be working towards the same goal. Um, the reason is, obviously, it's a lot harder to build something than it is to tear it down, and if somebody on your team isn't really on your side, uh, then that's, that's, you're going to have a bad time. Um, I think that a lot of us tend to be optimists. When we're on a team, we assume that everyone is, we have this childlike naivety that everyone's like, on the team, we're gonna build the thing, yay. Even if your code totally sucks, at least you're trying. Um, and that's how I approach teams generally. But every now and then, there's like this evil Lego man spy who's on the team and he's actually like actively working against it for some reasons that aren't apparent to you initially. I was on a team with eight people and uh, we knew from day one, because this project had been tried and failed in this organization several times, that many other people in the organization were actually incentivized for this project to fail. We could see them all over the place. It was really, really obvious that we were surrounded by people who were actively working against us. So we did the agile thing, and we put up a wall. And, and <laughs> the, 
the, the, the, the wall was helpful because it insulated us, right? So it gave us the safety to experiment, to play, to like, be creative and build some software. Um, and normally that's great, because if I have idea A, like, hey, let's use this library, uh, I should be able to float that safely without it being used against me in a court of law. And that wasn't how it was going, though, because right after I had idea A, within a couple hours, like architect Joe from over in the other end of the room would have it, and then it would spread throughout the whole organization, and suddenly the whole week is lost now to arguing over framework A when it was just an idea in the morning that I had. So clearly we had a mole. Somebody inside the wall was actually working against us. Um, and we had a really brilliant, uh, maniacal, but also brilliant, uh, tech lead and, and manager who took us each out to lunch under the auspice of, hey, let's talk about this architecture, because obviously the room's not safe. So we got a truth table coming up, right? So, so what they did was, <laughs> given these three ideas, let's kind of dole them out. Uh, so person one got idea A, B, and C. Person two got idea A and B. A and C, B and C. And then uh, breaking it down further, five just got idea A, B, C, and then presumably person eight got something totally just, just off the wall. So then we just waited. <laughs> Suddenly, idea AC emerges. Spontaneously, never having actually been talked about in the room, which identified, if you remember correctly, fingers person number three. Uh, and so we just found, you know, a very fun single uh, sign-on single authentication uh, project that was going to take him six months, and we thought he'd be perfect for it, and so we assigned him to that. And then our team moved a lot faster. <laughs> so unity is obviously really important to succeeding once, once you have people on your team. The last thing I want to talk about is patience, because like a lot of these other things are active. These are things that you can do to uh, actively manipulate the world around you and the, and the groups around you to achieve some goal. Hopefully it's, a, it's an altruistic goal whether it's personal or the success of your company. Um, but patience is sometimes the best play. Sometimes the best thing that you can do is nothing. And uh, uh, that's hard for me because I love tinkering. Um, but, but I love this example because it was uh, uh, really, really intense. Uh, has anyone ever like, imagined an evil boss or had an evil or crazy boss? Yeah. Right? Um, evil bosses exist in all kinds of organizations. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean the whole organization screwed up. Like, in, for example, in this one client that I had, there was clearly a guy who was just a really, really bad nut. Like, people would go out to lunch probably with this guy and be like, hey, this is Jared, kind of evil. Um, <laughs> but his coworkers, his fellow executives, they were all cool guys. I loved getting along with them. It was clear that they were trying to do the right thing. Um, but it was clear that Jerry, I'm just making up his name, uh, Jerry, Jerry uh, uh, had only risen to power like on top of a mountain of skulls. And once he had, <laughs> once he had climbed over all these corpses, like he got to the top and he, he, you know, shockingly he was a bad executive because he'd spent his entire career doing nothing but like climbing over dead bodies. And so he didn't know what to do with all that power. And so he just used it to be manipulative and terrible. And as a result, he was a ticking time bomb. We all knew that it was going to blow up sooner or later. And the best thing to do in that situation is to allow other people to fail. Because uh, if, if organizations are good at nothing, if not, responding well to failure, responding to failure, usually strongly, and making some kind of corrective action. And so that's where patience comes in, obviously, is you've got to let things fail sometimes. So this is Jerry at the top of the organization. He had three business analysts. Uh, uh, he chose business analysts to promote to product owners, people in charge of teams of developers, specifically because they didn't have the experience to tell him no. Uh, uh, and he also chose three of them so he could play them off of each other and be a little duplicitous and, and get his way without being easily fingered. There are also three development teams, perfectly capable development teams. And the problem, of course, is th these product owners uh, uh, had no experience in that role, had never run a software project before, and so they, they were a little confused from day one to begin with. Um, and as a result, the developers, who were all building one product but across three teams, didn't really know how to slice things, didn't know how to work together, I uh, didn't know how things would necessarily be organized. So right off the bat, uh, things were a little hinky. And uh, uh, that was before the lightning round started, uh, which is the, uh, you know, the, the crazy guy at the top starts pushing and pushing and pushing and making up arbitrary deadlines and saying, hey, why haven't I seen anything yet? And so naturally that freaks out the product owners. And because they don't have the experience of like, you know, what it's like to manage a software team before, the right thing to do here is to insulate your developers from that pressure. Because once that pressure leaks down, brains turn off. 
uh, uh, cognition is over, the creative exercise of programming is impossible, and everyone just starts updating their LinkedIn. <laughs> but they didn't do that, so those guys went crazy too. Uh, the product owners in this case, they just started feeling like they were, they were drowning. Uh, they, they felt completely lost. Uh, I got here shortly after this, so it was clear that everyone was really, really burnt out. Um, and then the developers, you know, all of them were just really, really sad. Like I say that, like, not sad like, oh, they're sad. Like, sad like, like uh, they just bought this multi-million dollar team space, this beautiful restored building, and on day one, I was there day one when they moved in, on day one, it smelled bad. <laughs> because these people weren't showering. And they weren't showering, not because they were working long hours on this project, they were actually showing up at like 10 a.m. and leaving at 4 p.m. They were like, not showering because their lives were bad. Like, this project had so demoralized them as people. And so clearly, this guy's had a very bad effect on lots of humans. And the worst thing I could do as a consultant is help him succeed. But that's my instinct. So this is like this little like gecko. I imagine like standing up tall. I'm gonna like you know succeed in the face of defeat. And uh, that's just my nature. I want to help every every project, every endeavor succeed, no matter what. But sometimes the right call is to retreat. <laughs> and so in this case, I was smart enough to at least sit back and watch this, you know, complete cluster of, of an operation. Uh, I was, you know, uh, like imagine something like this, like lean back, just watch it happen. Don't do anything to facilitate it. Don't try to wreck it. It's on its own. Uh, gonna, gonna fall apart. And uh, uh, just sit back and just watch it all burn down. <laughs> and, and it did. And, uh, uh, you know, it's true. A lot, like pretty much everyone had to find a new job. But uh, at least that guy wasn't in power for many years more, wrecking more people's lives. Um, so that's the power of patience sometimes. Even when you're in a, you know, a position of uh, being able to influence a team, sometimes failure is the best option, even at the macro level. Um, so those are four little virtues I came to talk about. You know, the importance of awareness of, of, of lifting your head up out of your cubicle wall to, to take stock of the broader organization and how you can improve it. Empathy. Of, Helping other people, you know, win and feel better and, and, and accomplish what they want to accomplish is the best way to get them on board with you. Uh, unity, the importance of just once, you, once you've got an endeavor, making sure that everyone's on board and, and genuine and honest. And then patience is always handy. It's always handy, but I always forget. So if you ever work with me, remind me to be patient and things will go better. Anyway, the message is take some of that and, and start to consider getting political. I want, I want office politics to not be a four-letter word, and, and, and hopefully people can have fun with it and draw stick figures like me. So thank you very much. My name is uh, Justin Searles. Uh, please tweet me at Searles. Uh, feedback, follow me or whatever. I'd love to, I'd love to get in contact with you. Uh, or uh, you can send me an email, hello at testdouble.com. We'll go to our general inbox. Uh, I own a company called Test Double. We do software consultancy, uh, uh, c consulting out of Columbus, Ohio. We're really excited about JavaScript, so if you hate JavaScript, feel free to send us work. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. <laughs>